Chachage, I'm, um, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow and lecturer at Princeton University. I'm also a blogger, researcher, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and today I'll be talking about the development trajectory in Tanzania uh, over a very long period of time. Many of my fellow Americans view the future. What historians call the long durée. Uh, but a couple of disclaimer before I start. So number one, I don't have the answers for everything. Uh, it's more of a presentation to ignite, spark a debate, uh, discussion about uh, the trends that has been going on in Tanzania over the last 50 years or so, and the prospects uh, from now onwards. Uh, and then the other disclaimer, I'll be using a couple of um, um, uh, slides in Swahili, which I'll try to translate for those who don't speak Swahili. Uh, but in some other cases, I'll just pass by and we'll just figure it out uh, on the basis of the context. So here we go. Yeah, now this thing has come. If I go to activation lock here, <clears throat> so the password is required to activate. No, it doesn't look like, look like you. So can everyone see see my screen? Janet, can you see my screen? Yes, great, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so for those who do not know, Tanzania uh, uh, is a United Republic that was formed in 1964 after the unification of uh, Tanganyika in Zanzibar. Um, uh, Tanganyika is what some people called uh, mainland Tanzania now, and it got its independence in 1961. And my presentation really will be confined uh, to Tanzanian mainland, even though in some cases uh, uh, the statistics will be the overall statistic of the whole country. And the presentation is really divided into two, into three sections. Uh, the first one, I'm looking at the kind of um, uh, framework of framing, framing that are useful in uh, looking at the at the at the at the, at the uh, history of development in Tanzania over the over a very long period of time. Uh, so, the, so the first one is uh, what I consider to be uh, the three epochs. Um, uh, the first one is the dichotomy between the first global economy and the second global economy. Uh, uh, whereby the first one was characterized by the emergence of, um, of the industrial revolutions that characterize uh, the rise of capitalism uh, in the West and its expansion throughout the world. Uh, it was a very hierarchical, racialized uh, uh, global economy uh, that went hand in hand with colonialism, slavery and racism. Uh, and it became, it started to, uh, to be dismantled during the age of decolonization uh, in the age of the end of the British Empire in the in the in the early 19, 19th century, uh, and midway to the second global economy, which, uh, in as much as it's still exclusive, but it gave a little bit of a room for some new nations, especially nations in Africa, and Latin America, and Asia, to emerge and try to expand expand themselves uh, in terms of development. Uh, and the way I define development is very, very simple. I know it's a very complicated uh, concept, but in my case, I'm, I'm defining in terms of uh, the capacity of a society and its state and this uh, civil society to provide what people consider to be the public goods to the majority of its citizens, especially in the key social sectors of education, health, and water. And then the other epoch uh, is a dichotomy or, or more of a it's more of an epoch of three kind of dichotomy, the pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial, post but the dichotomy that interests me much in this particular case is a colonial, post-colonial, because in a way it's really defined uh, uh, the shape and the trajectory and the trends of post-colonial Tanzania. I'm not saying pre-colonial, uh, Tanzania is not important, it's very important, and some of its institutions are still uh, are still there, uh, but the period that I'm really focusing on um, is a period that uh, was ushered by the age of developmentalism in the 1940s, 
uh, which continued all the way in the early post-colonial period in the 60s, and we are still having elements of development and developmentalism way up to now. And the last but not least one is the socialist post socialist dichotomy, which is very crucial to the history of Tanzania uh, because Tanzania at some point in time in its history attempted to become a socialist state or society, even though it had relative uh, success in that regard. And then the other way uh, of looking at, 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 at development, at the, at the development trajectory in Tanzania, uh, is by looking at what I call two watersheds uh, in, in our history. Uh, and in a way, this, this goes, uh, it relates to the epochs that I've just talked about. And um, crucial, I'm not going to, to talk about all of them, uh, but there are two particular watersheds that are so significant. So uh, the first one is in 1967, which is the Darusha Declaration on Socialism and Self-Reliance which I've just alluded to, uh, which was an attempt to really, really uh, come up with um, um, initiative, both legal and uh, policy uh, and institutional uh, to ensure that Tanzania becomes an egalitarian society, according to the principles of African socialism espoused by the first president of Tanzania, Mwalim Julius Nyerere. And the other significant one is the Zanzibar Declaration or what is called the Zanzibar Resolution, which in effect uh, uh, und undid the Arusha Declaration. This will become uh, clear uh, uh, in the course of the presentation. Another way of looking at it is looking at the legal, uh, legal uh, reforms uh, uh, in terms of the law that has been enacted over the years. Uh, and in the context of the Arusha Declaration and the Zanzibar Resolution, you can see uh, from the late 16th, uh, 1960s, there was a lot of uh, legal reforms uh, that were geared toward the establishment of institutions and entities that will attempt to spearhead uh, this, uh, the creation of a socialist uh, society. Uh, but within a generation, in the early 1990s, you can see uh, 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 there were some legal reforms that were geared toward and doing that in terms of the creation or the institutionalization of institutions that are more in line with the market economy or capitalism in general. Uh, and as you can see, those are the kind of institutions that were created uh, in, the, in the 60s, 70s during the socialist period and the one that came up uh, in the 90s during the post-socialist period that are still continuing now in an attempt to really, really uh, turn Tanzania into a market uh, economy. So now I'll shift to the second part. Uh, initially, I said that uh, um, the, the presentation is really divided into, into, two, into, into three parts. So the first one, I was really looking at the, the way you can look at history in terms of uh, legal history, institutional history, and so forth. Uh, but I didn't mention the two other uh, parts of the presentation. So the second part is really looking at the phases. Uh, uh, in Tanzania, when we talk about phases, we really mean the government phases. We've heard about uh, five government phases and this um, really defined in terms of the five presidents that we've had so far, starting with Mbolim Nyerere in the beginning and the current one, President Magufuli. And then finally, I'll, 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 I'll shift to the key sectors, key social sectors that will actually help us see what has been going on on the ground in terms of development uh, defined as the capacity to provide uh, uh, public goods to the majority of the society. And uh, I forgot to mention one disclaimer, most of the data that I'll be using will be coming from official sources, especially the National Bureau of Statistics or derivation of those sources for reasons that are probably clear to a lot of people who are following the politics in Tanzania. So that is a document, a uh, publication that came in August 2020 from this uh, government. Basically, it was more or less like a campaign kind of document, given the fact that we had a general election last year. It was trying to show the success uh, that uh, uh, Tanzania or the Tanzanian government uh, ha has been having uh, since the first, uh, uh, the first phase government over Nyerere. And you can see the key argument there in the trend is that uh, the food poverty, the rate of food poverty has, uh, has gone uh, uh, significantly down. 
uh, in tandem with the basic needs poverty. And you can see the key argument is that a lot of these changes, positive changes, uh, have occurred during this current phase, uh, the fifth phase of government. Um, as I said earlier on, um, 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 I'll be using a lot of cartoons from one of our leading cartoonists, uh, Masudi Kipanya, and because he's one of the people I consider to to be able to predict a lot of things in Tanzania, uh, uh, contemporary as well as futuristic. Uh, and you can see those are the kind of, uh, of cartoons that he has been um, um, drawing to try to make sense of the development story in Tanzania. Uh, so my disturbing water means clean uh, or safe uh, water for all. So Komeza malaria means uh, do, do away with malaria by 2005, uh, and the one on water was by 2015. And then my Shabora Kwakila Mtu, that, uh, that was about uh, better life for all. And you can see we are now in 2021, and, we are, and as you see uh, in some of the following slides, we are still having some of this uh, very challenge. Uh, some of this very, uh, these challenges that we are promised will either uh, have dealt with them adequately uh, in the previous years uh, or so. And those are some other uh, cartoons. Uh, the last one, I really like it uh, because it's, uh, it's talking about uh, the poverty line uh, in a sarcastic way, trying to show <laughs> how it doesn't, or it hardly captures uh, 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 what has really been happening uh, in Tanzania. Now, when you look at the trends over the years, um, almost everyone agrees uh, that the, the story in Tanzania, the story of, the story of post-colonial Tanzania, has been a story of early upward growth, followed by a significant downturn, downturn during the socialist period, and a reverse of that uh, during or after the implementation of some of the reforms that are associated with liberalization. Uh, that is uh, a figure based on the statistics that um, uh, Blandina Kilama and Mark Weitz um, um, uh, came up with, and I probably she'll talk more about it when she'll be doing her respond, response to this presentation. So, so this, almost everybody, whether you are in the left or the right, uh, or even in the middle, tend to agree that this is a story. You can see a more or less similar kind of image from the World Bank. Um, and again, you can see a more or less similar kind of image from one, from one, uh, one of the um, staunch critique of Ujama policies in Tanzania on social media, Dr. Wassam. Uh, you can see in his, in, in his case, um, I, I don't know where he got this image, that's why I had to cite him. Uh, but when you look at it, for, for that particular school of thought, the story is, is, seems to be straightforward. We had a market economy, things were better, and then suddenly with this Ujama uh, uh, attempt or experiment, and things became messed up, and then suddenly we had another, uh, we went back to market economy and things, uh, things started to be well again. Uh, and, and a lot of people who are either proponent of neoliberalism or, or even liberalism, generally speaking, uh, they tend to take this uh, straightforward or even simplified kind of a story. And for me, I think it's a story that has to really be challenged because there are so many, many factors that explains uh, why Tanzania took the kind of trajectory that it took and why we have that uh, uh, downward trend and then upward trend. One of them, simply put, Tanzania started from a lower base uh, in terms of all its social services indicators in health, education, water, and so forth, uh, because the colonial state really was created to cater to a small group of elites. Uh, and in the post-colonial period, there was a lot of attempts during the national building phase or the, the age of post-colonial developmentalism to expand this to, major, to the majority of, of the people. Uh, in a, of course, in an egalitarian manner, uh, and in a way, quality was was uh, um, 
quality was affected at the expense of quantity, and there are many other factors that probably uh, some of the respondents will, will it's talk. Agree business. I mean, that could be from any field, and um, it's really about. Uh, and there are many other factors, uh, ranging from the war Tanzania had with uh, Idi Amin of Uganda, that in a way depleted uh, uh, the, the foreign reserve in Tanzania, uh, to adverse weather, to the oil shocks, and so forth. They are not excuses, they are simply explanation to explain some of the uh, part of the downward trend that occurred uh, in the 70s. Uh, uh, all the way to the 80s before um, before the upward trend started going up. So now I'll shift to the cases and I'll be using a very recent report from the National Bureau of Statistics about school water sanitation and hygiene, which in a way is uh, ties with some of the mission of the host of this um, uh, mission and vision of the host of this event today. So when you look at the potential of school with electricity by region in Tanzania, you can see how uh, places such as Dar es Salaam, which is still the commercial capital of the country, the numbers, uh, the percentage is very high. But if you go to, let's say, the, the political capital, Dodoma, you see the number is very, very low. It's way, way before 50%, uh, standing at 37 from uh, uh, 0.8. Ironically, if you look at a place that has been uh, considered to be um, to be one of the underdeveloped places in Tanzania, Mtuara, uh, the percent is slightly higher compared to many other places, uh, but there they must be a reason for that because some of the other indicators there are still not uh, uh, still not good, and this is a place where uh, uh, there are some attempts to have a gas economy uh, uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so. But if you look at its neighbor, Lindy, which is also considered to be a relatively underdeveloped place, the percentage is still below of, uh, of 50. The same to Kigoma on the far, on the far, uh, on the far left, it's my far left hand side. You can still see uh, uh, the the percentage is very low. And of course, the government uh, uh, has been attempting uh, um, to provide uh, reliable electricity, um, not only to schools, but the general population. And for instance, it is attempting to build a very, very huge dam, which will provide uh, more than 2,000 uh, megawatts um, um, located near what was called the Salu, the Salu um, uh, national park or national reserve, uh, but of course it's a big debate. A debate has been going on about whether this is really a viable project, given the fact that there are some other uh, alternative uh, uh, for the provision of electricity, ranging from gas to uh, wind and so forth. Uh, but my interest here is to just show you that if you consider electricity as a public good, this is in itself is an indicator of how far we are still, how far we've gone or how far Tanzania still has to go to provide this uh, public good, uh, 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 not only to schools, but to its wider population. And then when you look at water services, uh, the story is probably, uh, uh, it's probably worse, because if you look at the commercial capital Dar es Salaam, uh, it's, it's standing at 68. Of course, we have some higher, higher numbers in Kilimanjaro and Arusha, which are again are regions that are considered to have developed relatively well than others uh, due to a lot of historical, historical legacy, historical explanation, ranging from the colonial times all the way to the early post-colonial period. But again, if you go to the southern part, Mtuara and Lindi, you can see uh, the numbers are very, very low. Mtuara we did well in electricity, you can see it's doing very poorly when it comes to basic, basic water services. Remember again, these are data on schools. Uh, and remember schools are the very institution that uh, are, are, are educating or training the generation of today and tomorrow uh, and so forth. The same story when it comes to sanitation and probably it's even worse, Dar es Salaam 57.2. Mtuara and Lindi is even way, way lower at 23.6 23 in Lindi and 22.9 in Mtuara. The same story in Kigoma. Uh, and, of, 
and even Kilimanjaro and Arusha, which as I said, are generally considered to be relatively developed, the numbers are not that, that, that big. We are not yet even beyond 50%. When you go to place like Simiru, which is a relatively new region, it's even even more drastic, 5.8. So you can imagine this is these are the kind of um, uh, this is the, the, the state of of the schools in Tanzania before the pandemic, just before the pandemic. And as you know, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, one ways of dealing of, with it uh, is connected to basic sanitation services and access to water, and so forth. Uh, and again, the same story, when you look at uh, basic hygiene services, Dar es Salaam, the commercial capital is way, way low at 21.2, but that in itself seems to be better than Mtuara at 6.8 or, or Kigoma at 8.8. So now if you look at the data from the, from the, from the, uh, from the Tanzanian figures, uh, you'll see there's been some, a lot of improvement in terms of uh, uh, construction of health uh, facilities, uh, um, increase of enrollment and construction of uh, secondary school, both public and private. Um, uh, and if you look at the summary that the government uh, gave last year uh, in August, you can see when it comes to education, the enrollment has shifted from 57% during the latest time all the way to 61 uh, and 82, and now to more than 90 during President Magufuli's period, according to official statistics, we can debate them. But at least uh, uh, for those who have worked in education, it's very difficult to deny the fact that the rate, the quantitative aspect uh, has really, really uh, shown some significant strides, uh, but not necessarily in line with the qualitative aspect. Uh, and these are the figures uh, for, uh, that the president gave in his uh, inaugural speech to the uh, parliament uh, at, uh, during the end of last year. And you can see, uh, again, the number of health facilities that have been constructed is a lot of them. Uh, uh, and it has, gone, it has more or less gone back to Nyerere's policy of free education, uh, even though it's also debatable because uh, uh, in why one way or another it has affected the whole uh, capacity of other entities, especially parents who subsidize uh, 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 schools uh, in areas where uh, they don't have enough resources. But again, according to the president, his argument is that if you have money, you want to support schools, uh, you can go to the, to the, to the district uh, development director and give your money there and then they'll know how to to, to, to distribute it to schools and so forth. Uh, but the core argument is that he doesn't want to see a student who is sent back home because he or she could, could or he or she or his mother or father uh, uh, could not afford some of the contribution that the schools were demanding. When you go to water projects, again, you can see a lot of investment, but you still have the rural urban uh, uh, divide and interestingly, the president in that speech, he, he, he acknowledged in that Swahili court there, he acknowledged that uh, during the campaign, one of the major, major challenges uh, that he had from the, from the citizens, from the people, was the difficulty in accessing water, especially, especially in, uh, in rural areas. Uh, again, We've been having all these strikes, but the challenges are there. Um, this is a recent report, newspaper report, uh, uh, citing the new uh, Minister uh, of Health, uh, Dr. Dorothy Guajima, uh, who, who is now going throughout the country trying to really revamp the, the health sector because there's still uh, corruption going on there. Uh, people are still uh, allegedly stealing waters. I mean, officials are, no, not water, I mean, medicines uh, and so forth. Uh, and this, this is a, even though I'm not specifically talking about corruption in this presentation, but corruption is among many of the- Many of them. Corruption is one of the many other challenges that are still affecting the provision of these uh, 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 key public goods, uh, which, as I said earlier on, are central to the definition of what development is all about. Uh, so I'll 
I'll play a clip. So that was an, the case of um, one snapshot on the health sector. And I'll play a very, very recent clip for maybe about one minute to give you a feel of what is going on in the, in the, in the education sector. Uh, this was a speech that the president made recently where he cited a school, uh, where he mentioned a school in Dar es Salaam that was having uh, some serious challenges about, uh, about uh, challenges on students sitting, uh, having enough desks and so forth uh, in their classroom. Hey, leo, tumetembelea katika shule ya msingi hiongo, shule ya mbaiko manisipa ya ubongo, uh, kata ya saranga, hapa ni mjini kabisa, kimara, kiongo. Shule hii ni shule ya nishangamoto nyingi, na hapa kama mnabiona, hapa ni mjini kabisa Dar es Salaam, lakini wanafunzi, wamekaa chini ya mti, na wanasoma hawa. Hawa ndo watoto wa dana sala sita, ambao wanategemea kuingia dana sala saba, lakini wamekaa chini ya mti, na mwalimu anafundisha kama jinsi mnabiona. Huu hili dakika iloshika ndio ubao wenyewe ambao wanautumia kwa ajili ya wanafunzi wapate kuona. Kwa hiyo tumeona tutembelee hapo ili na viongozi waone kwamba hii ni shule ya msingi Kingongo iko mjini kabisa mjini Dar es Salaam. Hapa ni Kingongo kata ya Saranga e, eneo la la, la Kingongo serikali ya mtaa. Lakini pia hata viongozi wa serikali mtaa wametembelea hapa na wao wanajionea kinachoendelea. Huyu ni mwenyekiti wa serikali mtaa yuko hapa kwa masikitiko kabisa anaona kabisa wanafunzi wake wamekaa Yeah so uh, you can later on watch it watch it on your own time but here I was simply trying to highlight uh, 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 something that the president himself highlighted. Uh, of course it started from a whistleblower uh, and people criticized I the whistleblower, but at least in this particular case, the president acknowledged uh, the role of that particular whistleblower to, to, to show this uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, of evidence that are useful uh, for policymakers and other people who are, are dealing with the education sector. And I know it's easy to say it's anecdotal evidence, uh, but again, back to the earlier argument, if this is happening in Dar es Salaam, what about places such as Lindy, Kigoma, and so forth? Um, and then I'll move now to the, um, to another, you might again consider it anecdotal evidence. Uh, this is of, uh, from a, uh, a place called Ngomero in, Moro, in, in Morogoro. This was covered by respected uh, media sources, showing the challenge that about 300, uh, 3,000 people, uh, residents of that village uh, are, are struggling in terms of accessing safe and clean water. But now I'll move a little bit from that gloomy, uh, gloomy story to talk a little bit about uh, the urgency or action that is happening. Uh, so even though these things are happening, there are some people uh, who are trying to change, to change the situation. So for instance, we have uh, Dr. Asqua Ilonga, who is a professor, based at the Nestor Mandela uh, uh, Institute of um, uh, technology uh, in Arusha, it's a university, uh, and he came with an innovative uh, technology based on nanotechnology uh, to provide safe, clean and safe water uh, to, to people, especially in the rural area. It's a very, very affordable technology. Uh, he won an award, a couple of awards um, for innovation in Africa. Uh, and, and, and the innovation came, uh, it has been there probably for more than five years now, I think, because I've been following it for quite some time. But it has not yet been scaled to the level that it can address some of the, of the situation that we've just seen in the previous, uh, in the previous clip. And I think this is an area that uh, those who are listening should at least try, try to, to, to support. Uh, he, he has a Twitter page, a LinkedIn page, uh, and the website, and it is trying to solicit uh, some support. He has engaged with the state, I mean, the government, but I'm not really sure uh, where they've really reached because this is something I think it can be scaled even at the level of uh, the formal uh, 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 tap water system that we have in Tanzania. And then this is for the Anna Mateta uh, Foundation, which has been very, very uh, 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 useful in terms of mobilizing Tanzanians on social media. 
uh, to provide uh, days for, uh, for school, for instance, particular school. Um, but we also have made, this is just an example of many other citizen engagements that are happening in Kremlin of trying to, 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 to deal with the deficit that is happening with these huge quantitative strides that the country has had in the education sector. Uh, and I think these are the kind of uh, interventions that uh, some or most of you should look at uh, when you are attempting to contribute to change things on the ground in Tanzania. But again, it's not an excuse for the state as the main custodian and the main pro provider of public goods to do its, its job. It's, it's more of a supplementary kind of uh, intervention. Now I shift to the last uh, last part. I know I've talked for some for a long time, but this part I'll talk very briefly because uh, this is the area uh, the other respondent will really be focusing on. Uh, so uh, generally, uh, uh, Tanzania is still an agricultural uh, society. Uh, uh, of course, we've had a number of attempts to industrialize, and there have been some shift in terms of the growth of the industrial and service sectors. Uh, uh, especially during the current phase government, which is attempting to industrialize. But still, when you look at the Tanzanian society, it's still predominantly a rural, uh, a rural uh, economy. And as I said earlier on, we still have the urban rural divide, where things tend to be relatively better in urban areas and rural areas. But again, as we've seen some of the statistics uh, uh, on schools, in some cases, even urban areas are also not doing uh, very, very well. Uh, and part of the challenge that we are having in Tanzania is this kind of dichotomy that we have between our socialist heritage and our uh, capitalist prospects. So on the one hand, there's a lot of discourses that are associated with socialism that are still going on, but again, Again, on the other hand, for the last 20 years or so, uh, both the government of um, uh, the late President Mkapa, President Kikwete, and the current President Magufuli has always argued that the private sector is the engine of development. Uh, but still, you are finding that in some cases, the private sector is complaining that it cannot really breathe uh, uh, because of too much state intervention or statism. Uh, that has been going on, especially in this current phase. Um, uh, this was a book but that was uh, co-authored by the late Ali Mufuruki, a leading African uh, entrepreneur and voice of the private sector. And as far as I know, it's the only book that had a forward from the president, uh, I mean, the current president, uh, and not least because it was trying to chart uh, Tanzania's industrial journey from uh, this predominance uh, 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 situation that we are in, in terms of being an agrarian economy, uh, so that we can move to a more, a so-called modern industrial economy. Uh, we are still, I mean, uh, I keep saying we because I'm Tanzanian. So Tanzania is still uh, relying so much on uh, some of the traditional exports, uh, uh, and it's also relying so much on minerals. For instance, at the moment, it's really bragging so much about uh, about the uh, the value that has been getting from gold. Uh, this past uh, this past week, uh, it was negotiating with uh, the private sector, um, uh, foreign private sector actually, uh, uh, for the mining of nickel and so forth. So you still have that kind of a structure where uh, the state, the society. Is still so dependent on the global, on the global economy in terms of exporting uh, both traditional and non-traditional uh, 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 produce. Uh, now this is back again to the dialectics that I was talking about, uh, uh, the dichotomy dialectic between a Tanzania that still has a, some sort of a nostalgia. Uh, uh, on his previous socialist ideals, uh, and in Tanzania, that is also still that is still trying to be a market economy, a capitalist economy. You can see the first president of Tanzania, Mwenyerere, was so much against um, uh, the creation of millionaires and billionaires. 
uh, but now Tanzania is bringing uh, that it has been creating millionaires and billionaires. This was that is from a leading uh, newspaper source in Tanzania. I don't know how true they are, uh, but because over the years Kenya has been doing well in terms of producing capitalists in Tanzania, but probably we've overtaken them. Uh, I don't know, but in a way it gives you that kind of uh, dialectic that could probably be useful or helpful in the development trajectory, but in some cases you can say is stalling the process because of a lack of clear, coherent uh, uh, national policy. Um, so this, I won't play this, but this was uh, uh, the current president arguing that he wants to see more billionaires uh, 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 in Tanzania, uh, but you can play it later on when you, are, when, when you have access to the slide. Uh, so now I just move to the conclusion. Uh, and the conclusion really is what I've just said, uh, that Tanzania is in some sort of a dual paradox. Um, uh, what you might call in Swahili, in Swahili we had a word, a word called numila kuili, which means you are like someone who's going into two paths at the same time, uh, especially contradictory paths. So I think Tanzania, uh, not only the current Tanzania, even, even the Nyerere's Tanzania, was always, always dealing with this kind of paradox. You are not sure you really want to follow exactly the socialist path or the capitalist path, and of course, you can have some sort of a mixed economy, but sometimes when you have that kind of confusion, it becomes very difficult uh, 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 to, to, to move forward. And last but not least, I'll just mention um, one debate that has been going on in Tanzania recently, which in a way uh, 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 sums up what I've been talking about today. It's all the debate about whether uh, development is the development of things or development of people. So the first president of Tanzania used to argue that uh, development is about the people. And some people feel that the current president of Tanzania is so focused on the development of things rather than the people. And uh, from my perspective, I believe what is so crucial is the connection between the two because it's the very people who need good schools, good hospitals, good roads and so forth in order to uh, develop themselves as individuals and develop the society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chambi, for that fascinating presentation. Um, a reminder, please do write any questions you have at this stage in the chat. Chambi, who's going to speak next? I'm trying to check first if uh, the moderator is here. Uh, Mohammed Yunus, are you there? Okay. So, okay. So I don't know what has happened uh, in China where he is. So I will start with uh, Aikande. So welcome, my candy. Can you give your brief response, please? Okay. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Chambi, for a wonderful presentation and the uh, kind of historical evolution of uh, Tanzania development. Um, uh, uh, so it's uh, it's very enlightening and. Um, I like the way you've uh, looked at it from different perspectives, including uh, the legal perspective and also the institutions. Um, I think my part is to respond on education and I am grateful that you have given uh, some uh, perspectives on education in the country uh, with regards to the statistics in relation to services such as water, electricity, uh, and also uh, enrollment in terms of rightage, et cetera. So, 
So I would like to just uh, comment on a few things um, in terms of questions that can help all of us to think through uh, the education and development of education in Tanzania um, from the historical perspective to the current situation. The first thing, and I think in uh, earlier slides, in one of the slides where you put the, um, uh, where you put the cartoons, um, I looked at one cartoons that had Ujinga, uh, which is ignorance, and um, I think you put diseases, ma, ma, um, diseases and something else. So uh, those were the three enemies that um, were the three enemies that Nyerere, I, if I'm, I can remember right, said they are the three main enemies of the country. And I've been thinking about Ujinga, which is ignorance, as an enemy of the country. And I don't think this has changed from then on, and it keeps coming uh, in different rhetorics. So my question has been, have we really securitized um, education in terms of um, to fight these enemies? This is one of the uh, greatest enemies we have in the country. Securitized in the, in the sense that if we take ignorance as a key, a key threat or security threat of the country, have we taken extraordinary measures to ensure that education is a core development uh, agenda to fight one of these enemies. So this is one of the questions that I've had for many years and I've reflected it even more in this presentation. Uh, in, in taking extraordinary actions on education, have we right policies in place? Have we put um, allocated adequate uh, financing uh, resources, financial resources and other kind of such as training to teachers, uh, investment in schools to ensure that we are fighting this education that we have had independence and probably even before. Um, so this is one of the things I think we should think as we think about education as part of a uh, development approach. Then I, 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 I looked at um, the, uh, in your presentation, you showed how the country has evolved in terms of political economy, uh, moving from socialist uh, to the market economy, and all the attempts to change legal structure, political rhetoric, etc. But the question has been, have we also uh, tried to do the same in education, alignment with the changes in political economy? How have we refreshed or reframed our education to align with uh, the new uh, development approach that we are taking. Uh, I was thinking about uh, vocational training, uh, higher education learning, which I did not see in your presentation, but it's okay. If we've really ensured that our skills development and skills building are aligning with the new needs that we, we are, uh, we are, that are required to really fit into this market economy that we are preaching, uh, to really ensure that the private sector that we're talking about is uh, supported or facilitated by the education that is provided. Um, going back to basic education, which I think you focused on your presentation with regards to the uh, access, you talked about access versus uh, quality, I mean, um, quantity versus quality, which in other words, we can say access. And uh, you talked about, um, the right age, seven to 13 years old. And I was wondering, the, the data, I think I did not maybe understand the slides, were those different uh, data from different sources uh, because we had different statistics or was it improvement over, over years? Uh, you can clarify that later. But uh, all in all, I think uh, we, 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 we have achieved enrollment rates maybe about 90% with fee-free education at primary level, but have we looked at quality and ability to retain in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, retention, a uh, completion rate? How do we ensure that we reduce the number of dropouts, truancy, 
so to maintain that uh, access and re enrollment also transition to secondary schools and also to higher learning and vocational training these are some of the questions that we need to ask and they relate so much to quality in terms of teacher student rate ratio in terms of textbook ratio student ratio in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, learning and, and 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 teaching materials so we we have a lot of things to look at even you, you show the data on student uh, on teachers teaching colleges for example but the question is do we have adequate in service training with regards to changing needs of education and uh, requirement for uh, for 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 yes. um, updated curriculum so there are a lot of aspects that Yes, uh, there are a lot of aspects that I think we need to, to focus on if we want to see really the relevance of our education and the relevance and alignment of our education to the, uh, the economic approach that we are taking. And I think as a country, uh, we need to revisit and to, to discuss this more in a more open way and in a way that really would fight the enemy that we speak about. Final aspect I wanted to talk is uh, with, relate, with relation to policy, education policy we have versus um, the political statements that may affect the quality of education, but also the access. So you spoke about, use the word dumilakuwili when you are explaining capitalism and socialism, how our rhetoric says this, but there's interference. But I see the same things in education, whereby the policy say this, but a political statement might come from a person with influence or with uh, power to, to change things, which is contradictory to the policy, also contradictory to the development uh, goals that we have. And I think my, uh, this, these are some of the um, points that that I wanted to raise and mostly for us to all of us who are stakeholders in one way or another to the development of Tanzania to think through. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aikande. Uh, now I'll welcome Jesper to talk about the water sector, the water sector. Hello, um, thank you very much. Um, Chambi, for your uh, presentation, um, it was really informative. Um, the approach and the way you covered the subject um, was really on point. So I think I'll go straight uh, to the water sector as you have uh, tasked me. Uh, but before that, uh, let me say a little bit of myself and the work I do uh, in, in regard to the water sector in Tanzania. So as I said earlier, I have been involved in the water sector for quite some time um, as a researcher, uh, but also an academic member of staff. And currently I am working um, in a multi-country research project um, that tries to you know, address issues of um, accountability in the water sector. So there are a couple of partners that are involved in this project, including the Water Witness International, which is based um, in the UK, but also Shahidu Wamaji based um, in Morogoro and Kewasa Net based in Kenya and Ethiopia, as well as in Zambia. So the reason I'm saying this is because um, some of the pertinent issues that you have raised in your presentation they are really um, related to the question of um, accountability specifically, but also uh, water governance um, in general. Um, all right, so let me also build on the trajectory that you highlighted in your presentation, but specifically focusing on, on the water sector in Tanzania. Um, I'll have a couple of uh, key random points before I go to the um, questions for discussions um, afterwards. So number one, I think you are, you are exactly right. Um, when you say, um, when we got independence in 1961, um, we had um, a water infrastructure 
that was inherited from the colonial past. And it was really not designed to, you know, address issues related to access and issues related to universality and so forth. But it was specifically tailored to address the, the colonial interest. And therefore, when the new gov government came into power, it had really to reposition the entire um, administrative um, and political structure, you know, to reorganize, to reflect the um, prevailing challenges um, of the time of independence. So that was a, that was a key point. And it, it was really a challenging moment. If you read the literature on water, you could see how uh, the newly independent government struggled um, on that front. Um, and then I was surprised you, you didn't speak about the, the next phase, which was uh, the SUPS, Structural Adjustment Program, um, because in, in many countries in Africa, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, that period was regarded as the, the unkind uh, period. Well, there, there are different, um, you know, interpretations and judgments, but um, I think there is a scholarly and practitioner consensus that between 1970s and um, 1980s onwards, um, there were serious challenges that not only affected the economic sector, uh, but also the social sector was significantly affected, especially um, social services, including water. And, you know, this was caused by um, a number of factors, um, including the oil crisis, um, the war between, you know, Uganda and, and, and Tanzania and so forth. And it was this period, I think, um, actually not I think, it was this period when um, we had, you know, significant mushrooming of non-state actors, you know, coming in in a bid to try to, you know, assist um, the government to provide social services. And some, some scholars call this particular period as the mushrooming phase, um, where you had an increased number uh, of civil society organizations trying to fill um, that space to provide social services, including uh, water service delivery. And then as we know, and as you have correctly um, pointed out, there was a post um, subs uh, period, which was characterized by economic and um, political liberalization, uh, where we also witnessed uh, another phase um, where the private sector was much more um, welcome. Now, in that trajectory, um, of course, there's a lot of discussion that we can go and um, and on, but I just want to highlight um, a couple of important points um, in regard to what you presented, but also in regard to the practical situation of water service delivery in Tanzania. Um, the first point that I want to um, to make is that if you if you analyze this particular trajectory from independence up to now, you could easily see you know, the active um, involvement um, of non-state actors, especially donors who, you know, comes in and try to help um, the state. And in this particular aspect, you could also see, you know, a significant amount of investments um, that donors pour into the water sector over time. And I remember at some point, Tanzania was considered as the, the darling, you know, of the donors. And um, uh, I think the water sector is the mostly funded sector uh, after the health sector. So the point I want to deliver here is that um, there has been significant um, investments um, uh, in the water sector by, you know, international donors. And if I have to give specific examples, for instance, um, during the, the water sector um, development program when it was launched and started being implemented um, in the year 2007 up to 2014 donors committed about 1.3 billion us dollars 
Um, and in the year 2015, 2025, the funding doubled to $3 billion. But concerns have been, you know, looming large that, um, um, you know, money has been flowing, uh, but water does not trickle. So this is exactly the question that I want to, to raise for, uh, for discussion. That why is it that you have significant funding in the water sector over the years from independence up to now, but still um, water related challenges um, exist? Of course, there are a couple of answers, as I said earlier, they relate to accountability and other factors, but I think it's, um, it's a food for thought um, question. Um, the second aspect I want to bring forward is um, you came up with very interesting statistics, you know, on how the water sector has performed over the years. Um, but uh, we know that um, statistics usually do not reflect the the true picture on the ground. And I can recall, you know, I read one of the paper, which was titled that, um, do we really count what counts? And, and basically the key argument was, you have very interesting figures and numbers and presentations, but when it comes to issues of, you know, access, affordability and universality, it's a whole, you know, totally different world. Um, I know that's a very heated discussion, but maybe in your response, um, you can try to highlight that as well. Um, the other thing that I want to point out for, um, uh, for discussion as we proceed forward um, is about um, the notion um, of different levels um, of, um, I mean, different actors and how they're involved in the water sector. And, and in this respect, I want to adopt um, a model which has been developed by the Accountability for Water uh, Research Project, um, which involves, you know, Water Witness International and Shahidu Amaj and other partners across the region in East Africa. And this has to do with um, three aspects um, in the water sector um, overall, but also specifically in Tanzania. And one is, you know, community dynamic aspects, um, enabling environment, uh, as well as the governance aspect. So let me quickly say something on community dynamic um, uh, aspects. You mentioned of schools, which is part of, you know, the community, um, but also citizens overall. So in my understanding and having worked in the water sector, um, there are different you know, power hierarchies and, and cultural aspects that are related to uh, the water sector. For instance, issues that has got to do with you know, how women access water, you know, how um, vulnerable groups access water, what kind of power configurations exist in the society and things of that nature. So since independence up to now, I think this front um, has had um, a number of challenges which are worth discussing, but also propose solutions uh, forward. And if I have to be really specific in the context of Tanzania and reflecting on the water policy 2002, it has um, uh, one of the components in the policy that speaks on community water supply organizations. Uh, for those who come in Tanzania and specifically in the water sector, they may be really familiar about this. There's been a number of challenges in regard to how um, community organizations or how community representatives are involved in managing um, water resources. And one of the key issues um, one of the key issues has been the aspect of, um, you know, um, operation and maintenance costs. Like the central government, for instance, would say, okay, we are decentralizing water service delivery to the community level, and therefore you are mandated to do uh, one, two, three, four. But when it comes to um, actual maintenance and operation costs, that has been an area 
um, which has been really problematic over the years and uh, issues related to sustain sustainability um, has been a problem over time. Uh, that's another area for discussion. And the second one is the enabling environment, which is the relationship between citizens and duty bearers. And this is facilitated by, um, uh, of course, I kind of talked about policy issues and legal issues. And also you mentioned in your presentation about the legal framework that exists in Tanzania. So we do know that we have um, really uh, good policies, good legislations, um, and good formal institution um, arrangements and so forth. But the experience has been when it comes to actual um, implementation and to see how communities can benefit, you know, out of these um, formal institutional arrangements, it has always been um, a challenge. So I would, I would like to pose um, a question as well on this area. How can we really, you know, realize um, um, what is uh, written in these uh, formal institutions uh, that is actually uh, accentuated when it comes to people's livelihood and so forth. And finally is the governance dynamics. Um, this one is, is really complex as you may all know that um, governance is some sort of um, a mechanism to coordinate a society. Um, and usually you have aspects like the hierarchy, the market and the network and through the hierarchy um, or rather the bureaucracy, in this case, the Ministry of Water is the institution that is mandated to you know, oversee, manage and coordinate all issues related to the water sector. And then of course you have the markets and the forces of supply um, and demand determines um, what should, um, what should um, exist in the market as far as what is concerned and finally the networks. Um, and in this case, it also adds to another discussion which I want also to say very briefly, the three aspects, the hierarchy, the market and the network, they're also related to how people in Tanzania, and this is based on my past research, how do they interpret or understand the concept of water? And very briefly, there are three kinds of um, interpretation on the concept of water in Tanzania. Number one is water is usually understood as a public good, you know, which is supposed to be provided by public institutions. Um, and number two, water is a private good, you know, supposedly supposed to be um, given by private institutions, you know, monopoly, I mean, uh, private companies. And finally, water is a common pool resource. And this is a typical situation in, in rural areas where you have pastoralist societies, uh, farmers, um, and so forth. So they're attracted to these common pool resources because everyone has the right to access them and there are no any kind of um, limitation. So apparently in this regard now, there are very um, unclear institutional roles, but also responsibilities, you know, between um, these levels. And, and this is a very interesting area where we can also uh, brainstorm and discuss. Um, and finally, uh, my very last uh, point, if, if Janet, you can allow me. Um, I wanted to throw in, um, I think, um, I, I don't want to, to consider this as, um, as a mistake or what, but um, I think it was important for Chambi to, uh, to try to highlight the, the water situation in Tanzania uh, from, you know, the time we got independence up to now and relates that to the population growth, because I think this is key. Um, population, as we are all familiar, puts, you know, a lot of restraints on water resources. And, and this brings in the notion of water uh, security, which um, Water Witness International and, and Shahidi Wamaji in Tanzania are trying to address, you know, these kind of challenges. So briefly, let me highlight um, Population growth in Tanzania from the time we got independence 
up to um, where we are now and how that affect um, or constrain or put restraints on water resources. So briefly in, in 1960s, when we got independence, we were about 12.3 million people. In 1970s, the population shoot to 17. 0.5, 1980s, 34, 2012, 44, 2018, 54, and 2019, 55.0. We actually, in terms of approximation, maybe 60 million. Um, interestingly, there is a concept of um, water per capita. You know, um, I think you have heard about this. If I have to define it very quickly, water per capita is the average amount of water um, each person in a particular area uses on a daily basis. Now, if you compare water per capita with the population growth over the years, the challenges um, becomes really obvious. And, and this calls for immediate solutions on how we can address um, these problems, um, including water security issues. So let me do a very brief uh, comparison. In, in 1960s, as I said, we were 12 million people. And water per capita in that particular year was um, 10,000 uh, cubic meters. And then if you move to the next year, 1970s, it dropped to 7,200. The following year, um, 1990s, that was 3,663. The next year, uh, 2,800. Um, and, and today, um, we have you know, plummeted to 2,200. So you can imagine 55 or 60 million uh, people in Tanzania, um, um, you know, with a ratio of uh, 2,000 um, water per capita in cubic meters. That calls for um, urgent solutions, that calls for thoughts on how best we can leverage um, uh, in terms of addressing this, um, these challenges. Um, in the interest of time, I think, let me end up uh, over there, Janet. I may have a couple of um, issues to contribute afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Konstantin? Thank you, Chambi, um, and, uh, and Ikande uh, and Jasper uh, for the quick uh, reflections. So I am uh, tasked to respond uh, with respect to the health sector. I must first uh, apologize to the health experts, which I am uh, not among them. I worked uh, very briefly in public health uh, a few years ago, uh, and in the interest of uh, of avoiding to 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 speak on uh, on a discipline that I am not necessarily uh, specializing on. But but anyways, let me let me respond. Um, so I, I, I'd like to give uh, first to kind of frame, and I'm going. My remarks are going to be uh, short. Uh, to to frame the discussion by first, uh, kind of giving a few uh, uh, pieces of information that I think are important in thinking about uh, health throughout uh, the period uh, that that Chambi's presentation covers. You know, independence to the present. The first is that uh, obviously, like many other developing countries, Tanzania uh, has done a great job of uh, increasing the life expectancy um, at birth. So we are currently at uh, 66 years at birth, uh, increasing every year, um, year on year increases. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised by the time the Magufuli administration uh, concludes its second term uh, at the end of uh, 2025, that we may uh, hit uh, 70 years uh, as a life expectancy. This is largely driven by the uh, great successes in reducing infant mortality rates. So in the year that I was born, uh, one in nine children uh, did not uh, survive um, beyond uh, their fifth birthday. Um, and, and it's certainly a tragic 
specifically when you subset that among uh, boys uh, during, during the same period. Certainly the contraction in the 1980s, in the early 1980s uh, of the economy and a lot of the public services that went with that um, contributed to really devastating uh, high rates of children dying um, before, before they get to, to maturity. That rate is now one in 25. So the latest data we have in 2019, it's about one in 25, about 4% uh, of, uh, of live births um, um, end up uh, with, with the child uh, dying. Um, now, what, what does this all mean, right? I mean, so we also know that as many African countries, Tanzania is a fairly young population. Um, the median age is 18. Uh, and so what that means is that um, about half of, of Tanzanians are no older than 18. You know, so it's a fairly young population. Now, the question that you could naturally ask yourself is how healthy and productive um, are these uh, young Tanzanians who, because of declines in infant mortality, are living, are, are expected to live longer uh, and hopefully live a higher quality of life than the previous cohorts and generations? Well, using Chambi's own uh, stats that he, that he cites in, the, in his presentation, you can see that there is a little bit of a mismatch in terms of productivity. So take, for instance, agricultural productivity. You, he showed in one of the slides that uh, as, a, as a fraction of our economy, as a fraction of, G, of GDP, uh, the agricultural output is only about a quarter, right? So it's no, I think it was 23% or 24%. So no more than a quarter of the economy uh, uh, output is, is, is in the agricultural sector, yet about three fourths of Tanzanian laborers are engaged in or employed in, in agriculture in some, in some extent. So, so fairly unproductive agricultural sector. Uh, when you read other authors, economists um, on this about uh, Africa is in, in particular, for instance, Tanzania's comparative advantage in agriculture, a lot of those have been decimated. There, it, it, is, it is probably unlikely uh, that, uh, that Tanzanians can be competitive um, um, on the agricultural sector in the ways that, that we had imagined a few decades ago. So in thinking about how healthy Tanzanians are, I wanted to kind of frame it around, um, you know, leadership, uh, political leadership, especially, precisely given the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic and thinking about how we may understand how the government of Tanzania has responded, but also what does that mean in terms of understanding the context to which the government and its people uh, deal with, with their health. So in general, what we know for sure is that the, 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 the number of people is going to be uh, quite massive as Jesper just ended, about 60 million at the moment. We, you know, the projections in terms of population, we're likely to be one of the, the largest uh, populations in the world within a few decades. Uh, and then when you think about not just the, qu the quantity uh, of people, but the kind of health and, and, and the quality uh, of life for these people, including access to education, as, as Aikande and, and Chandi have, have discussed, but also thinking more deeply about how they're going to be able to adjust to a more service-oriented economy, uh, to be able to take advantage of the digital space and the digital economy, especially given the kind of huge uh, uptake and embrace of, for example, digital um, uh, financial wallets uh, in Tanzania, you know, the M-Pesas uh, uh, platforms and others, including some of the kind of digital economy uh, workspaces that we see with the ride sharing um, apps like Uber and others. And so I, I wanted to kind of talk about political leadership because as a political scientist, I, I think uh, a lot about this and, and a, a lot of my work and dissertation looks at political leadership uh, with respect to the continent, but specifically um, in, in Tanzania as well, given, given my experience as a Tanzanian. Uh, why does political leadership matter? So even when you look across Chambi's um, uh, presentation, and, and you know, if you wanna think about it from any sector, but health in particular, you're welcome to, uh, a lot of the changes were you know, specific or precisely because of the leader that, 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 that was at the helm. Uh, this is certainly the case uh, during Malimu's 
uh, kind of heyday in the 19, the late 1960s, 70s, uh, as Jesper uh, had mentioned as well and highlighted, you know, this was the time when Malimu uh, managed to become the donor darling. And, you know, there was a lot of influx of foreign funding and, and, and things were, were quite plush. Um, things started to kind of fall apart in the late 70s, early 80s uh, the, for various reasons, the Kagera Uganda war, um, and, and of course the subsequent contraction in the economy that took us really uh, up until 2012 by, by some estimates, um, you know, to recover, uh, even when you assume a kind of modest 2% economic growth over the period. And so when you think about that, and then, you know, Mwini comes in and his style is different. There was a huge fight within government between the, the leadership of the reforms. You had on the one case, for instance, the former prime minister, uh, Cleo Pamsuya, you know, leading the kind of reformers within government to try and, you know, emphasize uh, policy away from government ownership, state sponsorship to more private sector led uh, growth. But then you had, you know, folks within, you know, including the kind of former minister of finance, Kigoma Malima, Kagoma Malima, who, uh, who was, you know, was really kind of conservative and wanted to kind of retain the Ujamaa era policies. In the end, as we all know, the reformers won, but, uh, but, but perhaps only for a, for a while, right? They certainly won during the Mkapa administration. Uh, I think that was the heyday of the reformers of which Mkapa was, was among the, the kind of young uh, protégés of, of these uh, reform uh, um, sect. But, and certainly with the kind of laissez-faire uh, policies of, of, of Yakaya Kikwete, the reformers and the kind of private sector, um, you know, really flourished. And in some sense, you know, some could have, could have characterized this as kind of like a wild west in terms of how government uh, interacted, not only with the private sector, but also implementing some of these policies, including some of the policies in the education sector, health uh, and agriculture uh, and elsewhere. Um, now, in my reading of the current situation and the current administration, um, the Ujamaa kind of um, state-led uh, folks are, are back, in, back in vogue. You know, I think they have regrouped over the last two administrations. And I think I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily clarify, I wouldn't necessarily think that, uh, you know, we could call this a kind of reforming um, uh, private sector uh, folks. In some sense, the Magufuli administration, especially in dealing with COVID-19, but in other cases as well, sometimes finds itself wrestling between what they think the president wants versus what the president actually wants. And so you see this a lot with the COVID-19 health policies where at various periods last year, the Ministry of Health would proclaim or direct something uh, to the public only to have the president uh, say something um, you know, that's contrary to what the, the health policy or the experts uh, had recommended, including uh, senior members of the health ministry. And so, and so you know, one of the things in terms of understanding not only the history of uh, the health sector, but some of these other health sectors, I wanna, I wanna argue is political leadership and, and which one of these factions is going to be in control of the policy agenda. Um, and it's certainly the case with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it isn't the, the, the expert-led, scientifically kind of minded uh, folks who are in some ways in control uh, of the narrative, in control of the policy levers that are required to deal with the pandemic in the way that it has. Now, whether or not this is good or bad for Tanzania is it, we, 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 we will probably have a postmortem um, analysis, I'm sure years down the line, some enterprising PhD student will, will probably estimate uh, the number of excess deaths to try and figure out to what extent has COVID-19 uh, in reality affected Tanzanians uh, health. Um, and, and certainly, you know, a lot of the economic impacts will, will be, will be uh, realized much sooner than that. Uh, but the question still remains, right? I mean, how do we then understand uh, the future of Tanzania, certainly within the, the, this last um, term that Magufuli has? I think one of the things that makes 
uh, the, the, the future unpredictable in some sense is precisely because you know, of this political leadership. So it's idiosyncratic in ways that the best way to understand how we can think about the, the future of the health sector and really Tanzanian society in general is to think and really study uh, the, 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 the individual at the helm. Um, and in this case, it's President Magufuli. Uh, to what extent does he, uh, you know, is he a, a more of a kind of a reformer, progressive kind of guy, or is he more conservative in trying to kind of reinstate some of the kind of heavy handed state led development? Uh, my, you know, my, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to to debate anyone on this, but I would say that he is almost certainly uh, much more conservative um, than than some of the kind of reform-minded uh, progressive factions that we've seen over the political history of Tanzania uh, since independence. So, take for instance a recent proclamation by the president that uh, corporal punishment, uh, uh, you know, he wishes that corporal punishment would be uh, reinstated uh, in schools. Uh, think about how the government through the presidency's uh, proclamations and policies has dealt with the pandemic, uh, you know, contrary to, to a lot of the, the, the rumors, but also, you know, experiences of everyday people where you'd still do have uh, infections within Tanzania on COVID-19. Uh, and tragically, you know, if you, uh, I'm sure uh, some people have, have uh, ended up uh, dying from COVID-19, yet the government kind of is, is, is kind of um, delicately balancing between asking people to be cautious while at the same time not acknowledging um, the existence of, of the pandemic in Tanzania. And so in, in trying to, I think, help anyone who's going to try to understand the, the, the trajectory from independence that, that, that uh, Chambi charts out and also the, the current situation and, and a prediction of the future, I think what we need to think about here is political leadership and not just at the presidential level, but at each uh, uh, other administrative levels, precisely because the way government in Tanzania is structured is that the president uh, really appoints a lot of the folks who have the political power to make things happen at the other levels of government as well. And so, you know, if you if you have a president who's more reformist, you're going to get the reformist kind of faction leading leading policy. If you have a president who's relatively more conservative, you know that's going to filter down to his uh, appointees as well. And so that's the that's the one point I wanted to make, uh, despite all of the uh, uh, advances and and improvements in health. That we see, I think the question to think about is how productive are, 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 are Tanzanians really uh, as a function of how healthy they are uh, and how well are we prepared to, uh, to really integrate and be competitive uh, in this kind of digital uh, global economy. Uh, thank you, Constantine. Um, so you can keep on asking, commenting, responding to questions on the chat room. Uh, now I'd like to invite Ruth. Ruth. Sorry, I was just uh, connecting my audio. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And um, I, I will try to add something after some really uh, incisive remarks from Ikande, Constantine, and Jesper, and of course, Chambi's presentation. And it's great to have this kind of overhead view and then also get um, both in Chambi's presentation, the, the uh, anecdotes, but but sort of slice of life of what this actually means, and then, then some in-depth um, examples from different sectors. So, so Chambi has asked me to comment on the numbers um, and, and kind of overall trends. So I have a few points and I'll try to be quick. Uh, the first is just on the numbers themselves. So um, you have presented, especially um, some of the more recent trends, these positive trends in terms of poverty reduction and uh, development measured in different ways. And in some of these recent reports, you know, things have really appeared to improve during the current phase of government. And I think a, a question that, that I'd be sort of curious to hear you and another panelist engage with is, 
the reliability of these figures. So in the past few years, there have been some challenges to the reliability of especially uh, GDP growth numbers. Um, so as, as many here may recall, in 2017, opposition politician Vito Cabue was arrested for questioning the GDP growth numbers published in the Bank of Tanzania's quarterly report um, and kind of arguing with, with other numbers from official sources that um, the, the growth rates reported seemed implausible. And um, a bit more quietly, perhaps in 2019, the IMF raised concerns about official GDP numbers, again, sort of trying to triangulate things and, and make sense of the, of the very positive story coming out of the government. And that report was not really released um, given the, the challenges that it raised. And this kind of relates to, you know, overall later, lately restrictions under this government on um, questioning official statistics and, and related to the Statistics Act passed in 2015 which criminalized the publication of false official statistics or the distortion of facts. Uh, the parliament amended this law in 2018, criminalizing the publication of statistics or similar data absent state approval that would invalidate, distort, or discredit state statistics. Um, this was led to substantial domestic and international criticism. And in 2019, the parliament removed the law's criminal penalties, but there are still um, you know, regulations on data collection and publication and especially questioning of official statistics. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, with that uh, restrictions on questioning official statistics, how does that kind of relate to um, the challenge that Ikande highlighted in terms of fighting Wajinga? Um, you know, if civil society Journalists, researchers, NGOs can't critically engage with these with these figures. You know, how does that kind of um, potentially hinder those challenges, or is this something that's a bit kind of overblown um, by the international community? And that sort of leads into my next set of comments, um, which are around the role of foreign aid donors and investors, and and uh, Chambi mentioned towards the end of his presentation, Tanzania's presentation on the, um, or Tanzania's dependence on the global economy. And um, I mean, certainly I think it's been one, one, one way in which uh, Tanzania has been dependent, and this came up in a few of the comments as well, is in terms of foreign aid. But this is something where if we take a kind of more recent perspective, there have been some really notable changes, and I'm kind of just curious what what folks think the implications of these are. So, um, in 2009, um, official development assistance, which is primarily aid from OECD donors, um, amounted to 70% of central government expenditure. And just nine years later, the most recent data point that I could find is from 2018 it's down to 30%. So reliance on, on aid from Western donors has really dropped by quite a bit. Um, at the same time, Chinese aid to Africa has been growing um, and to Tanzania in particular. And um, here the, the data is a little more hard to come by. Um, and uh, that's, that's to do also with kind of transparency on the, on the side of the Chinese government. Um, but there are some interesting projects that try to estimate um, aid commitments and receipts. And we see that in 2012, um, that's the sort of peak in recent years, um, Chinese aid in various forms amounted to over 1.8 billion US dollars. Um, and we can compare that to about 2.8 billion in official development assistance from OECD Western donors the same year. So clearly, Chinese aid is becoming a much bigger part of the overall aid portfolio, which is on the whole declining. And Magafuli has been um, very forthcoming with praise for this type of aid, um, given that it's not tied to conditions. Um, 
And this has kind of led to some hand wringing by Western donors and development agencies who say, you know, we have these governance conditionalities in place intended to promote good governance. And that's going to be a lot harder to do if um, Chinese government is coming in with no strings attached. And, and there is some research from political scientists showing that to some extent, those those concerns are, are founded um, that there's there's this very interesting study by the uh, political scientist Xiao Jun Li in a recent uh, journal uh, in the Chinese Political Science Review, and, and he shows that um, the, it appears that the democratizing effects of OECD's development aid in sub-Saharan Africa has diminished with the rise of Chinese aid. At the same time, there's evidence that Chinese aid improves local development outcomes largely due to investments in um, connective infrastructure. So really investing in roads and electricity. And of course, those things serve the interest of the Chinese donors as well. Um, but that kind of more straightforward uh, form of aid maybe is actually more, more useful than, than the aid from Western donors that comes with, you know, all this uh, nice language about human rights and good governance. But at the end of the day, um, what impact is it having? So I'm just sort of curious kind of how that maybe fits in to the picture here. Um, and yeah, I think I think those are the main points I wanted to highlight um, that are maybe adding something new compared with the other panelists. But thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I said earlier on, uh, there's a conversation going on on the chat. So kindly everyone, both the respondents and uh, the participants, you can contribute. Nobody has all the answers. You can ask questions, answer questions, dispute data and so forth. Now I'd like to welcome the last but not the least, Blandina Karibu. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chambi. And uh, I think uh, my bandwidth is really low. Um, I will We'll switch off my video if you don't mind. Um, and then I'll proceed uh, um, presentation. I enjoyed it and learned from in particular, uh, some of the cutoff that you decided to use, I think really, really showcase that somewhat um, there is still a lot of need to learn from history. Um, so one of the thing that I found interesting, and my intervention is simply going to be, I've been requested to speak more around the structural transformation of the economy and a little bit on poverty and growth. So those are the things that I'm going to cover on. So in your presentation, I think um, it came out very clearly that um, what happened in 1967 and what happened in 1991 um, is a flip, but Perhaps it was done too quickly without um, roots and a lot of things that we are seeing now is because of that switch um, that we continue uh, somewhat sometimes behave as if we are still in 1967, though uh, quite a number of things have changed since 1991. Uh, uh, Jaspa, Constantine, and, and of course, uh, Ruth at the end. One thing that is coming out also very clearly from your presentation is there has been a trend of having logistical support in Tanzania. And what do I mean by that? So we'll have a lot of uh, uh, social projects um, being put on. So it would be like, you know, you have the health centers built you will have the uh, water points uh, put up, you'll have the uh, uh, schools put up, but not last sentence that Ruth uh, left with is something that I ponder all the time and I think about all the time. In particular,
what are, what are the sorts of my three things that I said on the structural transformation of Tanzania? In your presentation, Chambi, in as much as you shared the economic growth and you showed one snapshot, I think it's very important when we look at economic growth, we need to understand where does growth come from? One of the interventions that we had today was, ah, it comes from improved productivity. It's improved productivity, productivity of both the labor side, but also the improved productivity of capital. So seeing that uh, there is growth in Tanzania, it means it's coming from somewhere. And if it's mainly coming from um, productivity of, of, of capital, it's creating the extractive sector that is the growth meaning the numbers where we have majority of people and fortunately we have not improved the productivity of labor in all the other um, other sectors that we have and i think um, that is something that we can talk on for a very long time because um, we keep on saying uh, agriculture is the backbone of the economy uh, because two-thirds of people are employed there but as you pointed out in your, in your, when you're sharing uh, the share of uh, agriculture and the economy, we only see it's only close to a quarter. And this was also highlighted by Konstantin. So I think um, when we're talking about trying to understand um, how do we move or how do we um, actually benefit from having a growth in industry or growth in services, the biggest part will be, we would need to go back and figure out what happened in the early 1970s when we saw up to before the, the, before the, Uga the Uganda war, when we saw there was a lot of investment that was geared towards import substitution. What happened there? You will see the financing was directed to words making sure we have right now when we say we are for the private sector we are for in that really the industries are going through or are we just supporting a few industries it's one third of the people. The question is, what kind of tools are they using? Because whatever technology they're using, it is that technology that is going to lift them or leave them where they're at. And it's very important to create an industry of the tools that we are using. We cannot say we want to develop if we keep on uh, using, um, now for the lack of words in, in English, I'll say using Vipuri from outside. Um, using all these different important to us they're being created elsewhere we would have to create our own and use them so whether we say we want to go to services all we know is that is a short term we will have to figure out um, how we operate within the, the the industrial side and we see how output is added there so Yes, the structure that we have as, uh, as the work that you cited can be there. Um, some of our work is showing agriculture is pretty much like a sponge. People stay there when they feel like they've been hit and they're not earning enough from industry. You wouldn't want to have that. You want people to produce um, uh, more productively in there. But then the next point that I want to raise is more um, the issues that you asked me on, uh, on poverty. The figures at national level, okay, um, if you move just one step down and you just do urban rural, um, sorry, your graph is going to be messed up. You're seeing some increase in urban poverty, which
which is unheard of. You're seeing uh, you have the majority of people, but importantly, HPS is also showing um, differences um, of poverty uh, with regards to women and also they show Sorry, somehow I got cut off. So, Blandina, can we pause there a bit because... Uh... So we have to really... Um, um... Sorry, Chambi. Oh, oh, go on, go on, go on, go on. Okay, so I, I, I was just finishing off with the, with the poverty figures. I'm saying, uh, let's not look at the, at the numbers at the national level, but it's very important to look at the lower level, then you can have a better understanding even when you're implementing other projects. So for me, um, it will be really good to hear some discussion around uh, how uh, the processes are being monitored. Uh, that will do for now, cheers. Uh Thank you. Uh, so we have, we only have 15 minutes. Um, I think some of the questions that we are raised on the chat room, especially about the GDPs uh, uh, and, and leadership, uh, leadership and governance have been addressed. Uh, but I'll address the remaining one when I'm doing my closing at the end. Uh, but at the moment, if there's anybody who wants to share their thoughts or comments, they can raise their hand. And then I'll, I'll, I'll select them. Uh, but you really have to be very brief. So any hands? So while people are, are, are still thinking about raising their hands, I'll address a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one uh, that I'm interested in addressing is the one about my definition of development in relation to leadership, in relation to the two main ideologies. So as I said earlier on, uh, development, as we all know, is a big, huge concept. Uh, there are many schools of thoughts in relation to it, many perspectives. Uh, but for the purpose of this presentation, I simply wanted to focus on the kind of definition that the majority of people will agree generally. So if you define development in terms of public goods, uh, and when I say public goods, I'm talking about the main social services that I focus on today, water, health, and, and, uh, and education. Then it means the provision of adequate clean and water to the majority of your population, access to quality education to the majority of your population, access to health services and overall uh, well-being of your people. So in respect to whether you're a capitalist, socialist, we can simply look at the society if we see the majority of your people are sick. The majority of your people don't have access to quality education, whichever way you define it. And the majority of people don't have access to clean, safe and clean water. Then for me, I would say you are either underdeveloped or undeveloped. So I just opted to take that definition uh, and omit all those major debates of what development is or not. And now if you look at all these indicators, definitely quantitatively there has been some stride since independence. Because number one, we started at a, at a very lower base. Uh, so quantitatively there's some strides, but one of the bone of contention is how enough is it, given the resources that we have as a nation, given the time that we spent uh, trying to develop, how enough are they when you still have students sitting down in a classroom in your commercial capital of Dar es Salaam? When you are still having uh, people not being able even to access a referral hospital in one of your major rural uh, area in the northern lake uh, zone of Tanzania. So that's where my focus was. And generally speaking, I think one of the solutions, and this relates to one of the questions that was raised, is, is about decentralization. I've always been an advocate of decentralization. Uh, and when I say decentralization, it's at all level. 
uh, financial decentralization, uh, decentralization at the level of governance, that will be helpful because uh, at least from my, my, my experience and my own research, it's very difficult to do changes at the lower levels of governance if you don't have the mandate over the money that is, uh, the money of productivity that comes out in your area, whether it's from the natural resources or even from the taxes uh, 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 in whatever your people produce. That's part one. Part two, when you don't even have the mandate uh, or control over the money comes from this, that comes from the central government. And in a way, this is partly why corruption has been rampant uh, over the years uh, and so forth. So I haven't seen any hands. So I'll just open the floor. Oh, okay. Martin, Genos Martin. Hello, yes. Um, I think there's two things for me. Um, I think we cannot talk development of Tanzania without really talking ability of political parties uh, in terms of having the machinery to create policy and having um, capacity of people to um, kind of enforce the policy once they get to the power. I think if you remember in the past, um, you know, CCM, if you had Kamatikuya CCM was meeting, um, they announced uh, Arusha declaration, all this policy used to come through the party, which means the party has a cap um, capability, had people uh, who could develop uh, inform or uh, evidence based or inform policies. But at the moment, I don't see that with any political party that have got machinery in um, that can do research, can develop evidence, and then, then that can be fit in to develop policies. So for me, my frustration is, look at CCM, it has been in power for all these years, but even CCM itself, um, every five years or every 10 years, um, they come with completely different policies because they don't have that one roadmap as a political party that they can follow throughout. So if you look at China, uh, the communist part of China, they've had same uh, kind of roadmap they've had since 1970s. So the easier, even the new government is coming in, at least they've got the foundation from within the party. So you don't see that with CCM, you don't see that with JADEM, there's N no political party in Tanzania that have that kind of the structure or kind of what we'll call um, external think tanks that can feed in uh, to develop agenda and policies um, once they get to the power. So that is one. Second, when you talk to education, um, I did, a, a, when I was completing my master's, I did a dissertation, which my question was on how university in Tanzania prepare a young people for the labor market or for the employment. Uh, what I found, it was, I, it was also again frustration in terms like, we don't have education policies. Uh, we, we don't have like, education philosophy at the moment. So, like it's like it's everyone is doing everything but there is no actual again a education philosophy that we can follow when magufuli came to power he was like um he had an industrialization agenda but that is not really feeding into the policies so you don't see on education that everyone within the, our education system is preparing in tanzania for the uh, for the industrialized tanzania so if we don't have the education philosophy again, it's like we'll be always back and forth. We'll come another government that will focus on agriculture, but then you know everything we've Magufuli have done in 10 years in terms of like industrialization will go to waste because this new government will have completely new philosophy or will have completely new agenda. So for me, those are the two things. Thank you. Tumaini, Tumaini Makole. Yes, thank you, Chambi. Uh, I would like to introduce myself first. My name is Tumaini Makole, uh, currently working as a pharmacist in Tanzania. I'm sorry I was late to join, but uh, I have uh, two points. First, I would focus on, on education. Uh, about two or three years ago, I read a report by World Bank Tanzania that more than 50% of uh, graduates, university graduates from Tanzania, they don't have the skills uh, that are required in the market. And today, I saw uh, a piece 
of paper by Jambo, a, 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 a newspaper, that more than 60% of graduates, uh, they don't have the skills. Then uh, I would like to know what are the challenges you uh, championed other scholars maybe could uh, help us. What is the challenge? Why gra our graduates don't have the skills which are required in the market? And then the second uh, point I would like, I would like to, to raise is that uh, we have seen in the past years, the uh, health sector has been uh, dependent on donor through health uh, bas basket fund. But in the first, in the first term of uh, Magufuli, we have seen a huge investment in, in health sector. Uh, I would like to know if there is any research which has been done uh, to assess the impact of that investment in, in, in terms of uh, maternal mortality rate and the like. Thank you, Chang. Uh, thank you. So we have five minutes. I'll give one minute to each of the respondents, and then the remaining one minute will be for myself to respond to whatever you feel from the chat or from what Tumaini said. I start with the reverse, with the reverse order. Blandina. Uh, thank you, Chambi. Uh, the uncles and uh, agriculture issues. I think that was a really good point. And it's very important to make sure um, if we are to produce, we have to produce in masses and we have to make sure um, that um, the organizations that are overseeing the work that is done by the farm is actually democratically and it's not like forced onto them. That's the only comment I have for now, cheers. Thanks, sir. it was really- Thank you, Ruth. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just amplify something that that's that's a conversation happening in the chat about with the choice of indicators to to monitor and kind of what drives this. And um, I, I think I'll, I'll amplify a point that Saeed Mohammed is making about the narrative being dependent on the observer. And um, so even just thinking about which statistics are are tracked and monitored and, and what drives that and then the connection they have maybe to the outcomes that we're really interested in. But thanks, everyone. Constantine. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to end with, uh, you know, some of the discussions on the chat. One, one, one person uh, asked about imagining a non-CCM um, uh, development path or trajectory in Tanzania. And I just wanted to kind of emphasize that one, it's not going to be easy to do so, given the, uh, you know, the, 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 how integrated uh, the, the party infrastructure is with, uh, with uh, the Tanzanian elites, but also to be careful, right, about this idea, I think, uh, especially among CCM uh, folks, to kind of uh, follow in the, in the Chinese suit, uh, you know, with, with the reforms uh, by, by uh, the Chinese leaders in the 80s about, uh, you, know, uh, they're, you know, that we're, we're going to basically, it doesn't matter how you skin the cat, you know, there are many ways to skin the cat, because that could be very dangerous politically, because it then assumes that the only path to development is through CCM. And I think that's a, that's a very dangerous line uh, to take moving forward. Jasper? really very exciting uh, discussion and um, just to end up one minute I think um, there is an exciting opportunity if I try to analyze you know the whole discussion that we have had um, the bottom line goes down to issues related to especially in the water sector issues related to accountability and, and water sector governance so there is an exciting opportunity as I mentioned earlier on 
and that um, you know we can leverage and mobilize um, various actors and forces to to try to hold um, those in positions of authority or those in power to account to citizens. And in this regard, I would like to invite everyone who has participated in this session uh, to follow the work that we're doing in Tanzania, in Ethiopia, and in Kenya in regard to you know how citizens can be empowered to uh, hold UPPL as a public official to account, especially in the water sector. And um, you can easily visit the website Water Witness International, www.waterwitnessinternational.com, and you can learn more about the work that we're doing in Tanzania. Otherwise, um, I think um, these kinds of forums need to be conducted quite often, and they're really um, exciting. So I, I'm looking forward to the next one. In that regard, thank you all, and wish you all the best. Thank you, Aikande. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, everybody. And I think uh, education is holistic. So we need to, if we want to ensure that our, our citizens are educated and have appropriate skills, we need to invest from basic education, from early childhood to the, to the higher education. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Uh, so thank you. Uh, for me, um, my overall conclusion really will, will be to address one or two questions quickly. So number one, there was a question about the issue of language instru of instruction in schools. This is a never, never ending debate. For those who know me, I've always supported teaching in Kiswahili while teaching English properly as a language. But we know over the years we've had uh, all these confusing kind of policies with strong argument from both camps. But for me, this in a way connects to the whole debate about development. Uh, I know some, some of you have raised the issue of development again in this definition, and I totally agree. Uh, development has an ideology called developmentalism. In a way, uh, the idea which shaped our understanding of development. But at the end of the day, as I said earlier on, at the end of the day, one of the reasons why we're having this kind of discussion about development and under development uh, is because when you walk in the streets, in the villages, in the regions of our country, there are places when you look, you see people are not getting clean and safe water. Some people are not getting quality education. Some people are not getting, uh, are dying or not healthy. So you can call it whatever you call it. You don't have to call it a development, but it's something that is observable there and something has to be done about it. At the end of the day, the story of development is really, in Tanzania, is a story of quality and quantity, balancing quantity, quality and quantity. And generally, we've done very well over the years, relatively well in terms of quantity. The challenge has really been quality. Uh, thank you, and I'll, uh, I'll return it to Janet. Uh, thank you for hosting us. You've, the floor is yours. Well, thank you um, so much, um, Chambi, and all of the presenters and everyone who participated. So I will be sending out the recording and the slides tomorrow. Um, please do follow us on Twitter and other channels to find out about the next webinar, which hopefully will be very soon. So thank you very much. <laughs>